Welcome to uh, Animal Justice Academy Lunchtime Live. Welcome to all of you fine souls here with us live and welcome to those of you watching the replay. Today we're exploring alternatives to experimenting on animals and we have the brilliant and compassionate Dr. Charo Chandrasekhar um, joining us and uh, Chandra, uh, I mean, uh, Charu and I were talking about her last name, which I butcher almost every time. Um, so she'll she'll give you the actual um, pronunciation of it. But let me give you a little bio as we're bringing up Charu. So Charu is the founder and executive director of Canada's first and only center dedicated exclusively to alternatives in testing. The Canadian Center for Alternatives to Animal Methods, known as CCAAM, uh, located at the University of Windsor. Now. Charu is an experienced scientist. She's a former animal researcher, so she knows of what she speaks, um, a science policy expert, and of course, an animal lover, and we love her for that. Through her center, Charu promotes the replacement of animals in Canadian biomedical research, chemical safety testing, and education through 21st century science, innovation, and ethics. Charu, welcome. Do we have Charu spotlight it, spotlit? Okay. Uh, here, yeah, Hi. there we go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Charu. So nice to see you, darling. Um, so nice to be here. Thanks for all the love. I was just saying to Kimberly earlier. It's nice to be in a in a community where I'm not confrontational with anyone. <laughs> exactly. Um, which it can be like that, but you know, for the most part, it's just amazing. But thank you so much for the invitation. Um, uh, well, Charles, unless we get into a, like a, a fist of fight over whether we like cats or dogs better, I think we're okay. Oh, today. <laughs> oh it's going to be, it's going to be cats. <laughs> oh, okay. No problem. We're good. In my world. <laughs> uh, I think all of the animal justice team, plus all of our like close allies, our, ten, our cat people, I'm not sure. I mean, of course we love dogs. Of course we love dogs. And I'll tell you more about that, um, that uh, you know, about a project that we specifically have to reduce um, the, the use of dogs in chemical safety testing mm, wonderful. Yes, of course we love dogs but cat cats ruled my world so that's right that's right <laughs> exactly well and, and and charu you are an aj instructor favorite um your module the state of animals exploited in experiments i think is one of the most watched in the aja course and and uh, we're so excited to pick your brain how does it feel being such a popular aja instructor <laughs> oh <laughs> oh i don't know i mean i'm very grateful for the support and and um the love that i continually um get from your academy and for you know for raising awareness on this topic so one of the biggest issues is really the public is unaware of the extent of animal testing that happens in this country or in general around the world um so it's really nice that everyone's um excited about that module and that it's been educational for you so i'm very grateful Hmm. Okay, so Char, let's start off with um, telling us about the center, how it came to be, and what you do there. And, and maybe like, I would really like to hear a little bit about what made the switch for you. Like you went from being, a, a, you know, somebody who was researching using animals to doing this. Um, so give us a little bit of the background. Oh, you want the whole story? Oh, okay. sure. Why not? <laughs> we didn't uh, get that in the module. I'll, uh, I'll I'll make it quick. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting. It's been honestly a humbling, in interesting, and an inspiration journey for me. I don't even know how I ended up here. Uh, sometimes I wonder um, how it all transpired, but it was truly meant to be. So I was an animal researcher. I was doing um, animal work with mostly mouse and rat models of heart failure and diabetes. And during that time, I was looking at these receptors that are expressed in a certain part of the heart that if they're activated in time um, during a heart attack, it will actually help you recover better. So we were looking at the properties of these, you know, molec this molecular machinery in the heart cells. Um, and we're doing this using animals, um, mice and rats. And um, during this time, so I was about four years into this work, my dad actually had a heart attack um, and he required quadruple bypass surgery. So I went out, they were out east at the time. And I remember, during his recovery, just, you know, the day after his surgery, I was at his bedside for about three weeks, but just sitting in that ward in that hospital, the Halifax Heart Center, um, I looked around, I looked at him, and I looked around everyone else who'd gone through these surgeries, whether it was a bypass or a stent or whatever it was, and I looked and I truly wondered 
if the work that I was doing was going to help patients like my father and everyone else sitting there. And it was just profound realization that no, it's not. Because by this time, four years into this research, I had already discovered um, how much of the work that I was doing was not translating to human and humans. And also at the same time, how much of that mouse work was not reproducible between laboratories. In fact, my research project was geared toward resolving a controversy in the field, which means all the top researchers in the field, uh, their results did not correlate with each other. So I was with him for almost a month. I came back to my laboratory and then I was, um, uh, talking to a career researcher in cardiovascular field who was also looking at these receptors and who knew everything about these receptors. So I was just joking with, with him and I said, hey, do you think these receptors were activated in my dad's heart during his heart attack? And his response was something that truly um, got me started on this journey. I wasn't quite ready to leave animal testing at that time. Um, because I had my own justifications for it. But I asked him, I said, do you think these receptors were activated in my dad's heart? And he said, how the hell would I know? I've never looked at this in human hearts. He had been a cardiovascular researcher for 25 plus years. And so if you hadn't taken the time and the system, the scientific culture that we have, hadn't required him to look at it in 25 plus years of a scientific career that's funded by taxpayer money, I just thought to myself, what the hell am I doing here? Because I did not go into science to, to cure mice of heart failure. I actually wanted it to help humans. So that was a profound um, a realization. It was like an epiphany. And I actually ended up leaving academia within a year. Um, I wanted to leave. I actually switched labs uh, shortly after, but I stayed in animal research for another year and worked on animal models of diabetes. Um, and then I said, that's it, I'm done. A number of different things happened with the diabetes research as well, that nothing was reproducible. The, the results we got between male and female mice. So the one of the project was that these were genetically modified animals. They were missing um, an important uh, molecule that's, uh, that regulates glucose. And it, uh, the male mice were sick. Like their blood sugar levels were about, above 20 millimoles per liter and that you would not that kind of um, uh, blood sugar levels would put a human in a coma mm -hmm. but the female animals who had the exact same gene deletion were normal they had absolutely no signs of diabetes at all so how do you reconcile that and so there's so many issues with that too so more and more that during that year I was exposed to even more reasons to leave animal work and I finally left and I joined the physicians committee for responsible medicine um, as their director of laboratory science and so that was starting 2013 um, like middle of 2013 when I joined them and that really changed my life because through that organization I went to um, a lot of different meetings with scientists from academia, from government, from industry, um, and a lot of global scientists as well. And every meeting that I went to, I was just in awe of the developments that were happening around the world. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me, we don't really have anything in Canada. So that's how it really started just a, a few years later. So I started in this field in 2013 by 2016 was when um, I decided that we needed to open a research laboratory in Canada dedicated exclusively to promoting alternatives to animal testing. And um, I know I'm talking a lot, but- No, <laughs> I'm I love this story. And to know, um, I'll finish that story because it's interesting. Uh, I was just really born on the back of a napkin. Um, and I wrote up a two page proposal, but I did not first approach the University of Windsor. It was another university in Ontario that I, I went to, um, to um, due to you know something that I don't quite want to talk about. Um, I'm not sure if I should be disclosing that information, but I, I went, went somewhere else uh, because of somebody else uh, who really encouraged me to go to this university. So I proposed it and um, had a meeting with some of their top administrative people. And the Dean of Medicine at this university looked at me and said, you've got to be kidding me. I don't want to offend my animal researchers. So, and I said, well, you've got to be kidding me because Johns Hopkins University, um, that receives 
hundreds of millions of dollars of federal funding from the National Institutes of Health to do animal research in the United States. They also host world's first Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing that was established in 1981. So if they can do it, you certainly can. I got up and I left. Wow. Um, and then I then a few months went by and, um, and I thought, no, this idea cannot die. So one day I wrote to the Vice President of Research and Innovation at the University of Windsor. And um, I asked him if I could get some time to speak with him about a proposal that I had. And I sent him the proposal and I met with him a couple of days later and I was surely hoping to get the same response from him. But I walked into that room and he said, let's do it. Wow. We need to invest in um, the future of medical research. So here I am. I absolutely love the University of Windsor. It's one of the most progressive and forward thinking universities in this country. And their support for this work, you know, this is not a battle between animal researchers or, you know, or, or alternatives. It, it's really about doing what's best for humanity, for animals, for us, right? This is not just an animal rights issue. Uh, and we shouldn't just look at it like that either. It's really about humans. What are we going to bring to the forefront for humans? What about all these people who've been waiting around for decades for cures for diseases like Alzheimer's, um, ALS, muscular dystrophy? There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing there that would help them get better. Mm. So and, you know, so, you don't want to get me all rise up. <laughs> no, I love. Don't you love her fire, everybody? I love Charo's fire. <laughs> um, you know, and so, so uh, you know, I want to. I do want to talk about like the animal aspect of it in a yeah. second. But first, I think it's really important for us to get clear about you know and expand on this whole idea of what sort of drove you out of academia to start with the in efficacy. Of animal um, of animal experimentation, can you tell us a little bit about this? Yes, it's like some simple. of the numbers. It's a very simple. Ninety five percent of um, ninety five percent of drugs tested to be safe and effective in animals fail in human clinical trials. It's about ninety two percent for cancer, ninety nine point six percent for Alzheimer's disease, and everything else is in between there. Um, and it's it that that's what it is right now. Um, and there's, <laughs> what else can I say? 95% failure rate. This must be the, one of the only industries on the planet that seems to accept that kind of failure rate. Well, De Debbie in the chat said, Char uh, Charu, we wouldn't drive a car where the brakes worked only 5% of the time and we wouldn't <laughs> buy a phone that drops 95% of the calls. So why do we continue to uh, fund junk science on animals at this, that has the same rate of failure? So true. Unbelievable. And then yeah. even with that 5%, Charu, that's not even 5% that like actually goes forward and, and become like gets, you know, we have access to, right? So, you know, once you pass a drug, then there's still a chance for it to be recalled um, and, you know, to get a black box warning because there are other um, side effects and adverse effects that were not predicted in animals, right? So this has happened. We've had a lot of, you know, drugs being recalled. Um, and the other issue is, um, you know, what about the drugs? It's not just about the drugs that go through the pipeline and get act, uh, um, approved, but also what about the ones that we missed out on? Because if you test a drug on an animal and there is a side effect, um, you know, like birth defects, for example, there is no way that it would ever proceed beyond that to human clinical trials. So we may have missed out on a lot of drugs that could work very well for humans, and but they had some irrelevant side effect in animals, so they were halted in that path, right? Aspirin is one of the primary examples because aspirin came into market long before, right? Aspirin was used uh, by the Egyptians because it's derived from white willow bark. Um, so it was back in the early, late 1800s, um, early 19, I forget, 1903, somewhere there, um, when animal testing was still not regulated um, for the approval of drugs. It came into market at that time from Bayer. So if, an, if aspirin were to go through animal testing the way it is done today, it would never be approved for human consumption because it causes birth defects in pretty much all the common laboratory species, mice, rats, guinea pigs, rabbits, cats, dogs, sheep, or monkeys. Um, so that's aspirin, leave that aside. But how many other drugs have we missed out on um, and we wouldn't really know 
Yeah, that's the part that really hit me, Charu, is uh, when I sort of delved deeper into this is I was like, oh, my God, what a terrible, you know, rate of success for for drugs going uh, to to market. But then I, I went, OK, wait, a, what didn't go through? Um, and the idea that we might have already found a cure for cancer in humans, but threw it away because like a mouse had an adverse reaction to it or something like that. It's it's uh, it's mind boggling. It's uh, it's mind boggling indeed. It's a mm. light way of putting it. <laughs> well, and and so why why is there uh, first of all why is there this high rate of uh, of inefficacy uh, in testing in animals and you know for human drugs and and also just you know human uh, research um, and and well let's start with that why why is there why is it so bad why are animal models so bad as predictors. Well, that's going to take me all afternoon um, to talk about that. But very yeah. briefly, there are lots of differences, right? This really comes down to, um, and I think I said this in the in in my Animal Justice Academy talk. There are three areas of differences. There's experimental difference differences, biological differences, and species differences. So when you're thinking about how we make these animals sick, so you know the average mouse or the guinea pig, um, they don't get Alzheimer's the way humans do. So first we have to create the disease in these animals. So the the, the experimental method of creating diseases um, in these animals oftentimes differ completely from how humans get a certain disease, right? If you're doing diabetes, for example, you can surgically remove the pancreas of a mouse, but that's not how humans get type two diabetes. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that are wrong with the way we induce diseases in these animals and they're, they take a lot shorter time, unlike how, you know, how long it takes for humans, for example, to develop some of these chronic diseases, it takes decades. Mm -hmm. So there are problems with experimental disease induction ways. And then there are biological differences, like sex differences as the one that I just mentioned that I've personally experienced experienced um, and there are uh, strain differences you know there are hundreds like several a couple of hundred mouse uh, strains um, that you know de depending on how you breed them you can cross breed them so whether you're using a, a just for simplicity a black mouse or white mouse or a brown one or a yellow one um, there are lots of biological differences within those um, strains as well um, and then age, you know, in our lab, when I, where I worked, we would only use mice between eight to 10 weeks old. And as soon as they get above that, the biological, the, the differences in the results are, are stark. You, you can really tell. Um, so you, you do a certain age group. So there are age, sex, and strain differences. And then the rest is really evolution. We've been separated from these rodent ancestors for hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And there's really no way to overcome um, those immutable species differences, right? And we may have the same machinery, the molecular machinery, or even the same genes, but the way they're regulated, how they get activated or inactivated under certain circumstances, those are totally different. Um, between these species and this is that's the thing in, in short and simple we are not 70 kilogram versions of mice rats rabbits cats dogs sheep guinea pigs <laughs> yeah absolutely oh my god like it just seems <laughs> it just seems like um completely this makes so much sense yet we are stuck we seem to be so stuck in this animal model um us, but the science scientific community can can you talk a little bit more about that Charu why why like are they not seeing the same um stats like what what has allowed them to kind of cover their eyes and go no no, we don't see this the scientific community is fully aware of the limitations you know every time a paper is published you are supposed to address the limitations of each model so the community is aware but um, it's not easy to overcome. It's, it's, you know, these issues with animal testing, animal experimentation is just as cultural as it is scientific. Um, we have a scientific culture globally that's entrenched, that's ingrained in animal research, right? That's been the predominant way of doing things. It's animals serve as the gold standards, rodents actually serve as the gold standard for most of our drug safety testing, chemical safety testing, and biomedical research um, endeavors. And 
the culture um, is just ingrained in that. And it's really difficult to change that because everybody's like, if I don't do this, how am I going to do it? And so the culture is so bad right now, you know, to the point where um, I think in general, the scientific culture is obsessed with curing disease in animals um, and to the point where we are uh, neglecting these differences and even asking researchers to quote unquote validate and confirm um, human data using animal models. That's what it has come down to. We consider human data to be anecdotal so often. And we require scientists like, you know, the animal researchers would ask scientists like me and so many other people like me around the world to say, oh, well, you need to validate your animal model. And this happened, one example um, I can give you, I think there was a recent paper, um, there was a, an organization in the EU somewhere that published a paper on animal research bias. So, and that's, where when you try to publish a paper or try to get a grant funded through peer review, uh, what this is one of the number one questions. Yes, your proposal may be amazing. And these are some of the comments that I get. I got for one of my 3D bioprinted lung models um, was yes, it's a, an innovative, creative, novel model that's even time relevant. They use that word as well. But then they said, you need to validate your chemical safety testing data using a mouse model and a five-year research project cannot be justified without animal work. So, I mean, who, so if that's the culture, then everybody somehow feels that either they, they can't do it without using animals or that they have some sort of obligation to stick just to the an, animal things. And this is not a problem at the researcher level. This is how it is, right? With the funding agencies, with the journals, with everything, right? So it's, it's everyone... Um, who's a stakeholder in this scientific culture has a role to play. Uh -huh. Penabre said the publisher parish model in university plays a role probably too. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. it does. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And so it, that really does, you know, beg the question. I mean, going after scientists and trying to change their minds is, isn't it. We need to change it at a, at a much higher systemic level. Is that right, Charu? So there are, um, obviously we're breaking through this, right? Um, there's been a lot of, um, lot of progress made in chemical safety set testing. So I wanted to say that, you know, the two major areas of animal use is, is biomedical research. This is where we try to understand um, disease, human disease, the molecular basis of disease. And then the other area is drug and chemical safety testing. So we've made a lot of um, progress in that area. Um, in terms of moving away from this, there's a, a real cultural shift in the chemical toxicity testing area. Mm -hmm. mm. And, you know, before, you know, as good animal advocates, it's important to be able to communicate um, information accurately. Um, and so, uh, you know, someone was telling me the other day how a scientist they knew was complaining that animal activists don't even know the right terminology, you know, like saying testing when it should be research or you experiment. You know. Can you educate us, Charo, just really quickly? Are there any words or phrases that cover everything, biomedical, testing, everything? So, if you're, you know, calling it animal testing, research, experimentation, I mean, they're interchangeable, right? Unless somebody wants to be really picky about it. Um, there are some nuances. Um, I guess when you say animal research, that could be primarily associated with biomedical research. So understanding the molecular basis of this disease. So this is the kind of research that most often happens um, in academic institutions where you're trying to understand, right, in Alzheimer's disease, you know, what, what happens in the brain, all the molecular signaling, whatever it is that you're looking at. So that could technically be considered animal research. But and then animal testing could be product safety testing, right, whether it's chemicals, um, cosmetics, pesticides, drugs. So there might be a slight difference there, but when it comes to um, sort of advocacy work, um, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you, what you call it. It, it is the use of animals in science. So the use of animals in the life sciences, and that can be, you know, testing, experimentation, research. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you at the really, end of the day, if, it's all yeah. the same. <laughs> if you wanted, if you were talking to a scientist, though, folks, you might want to say animals used in science. I think that that covers it. So that's great to know, Charo. And and you so just and again, you gave us a really good um, overview of the types of um, 
uh, science, sciences that use animals uh, or the way that animals are used. Um, so you said biomedical research, you said chemical safety testing, and then there's a third category and that's education. Can you give us just a little rundown yeah. of that? So education is where you actually um, use animals for like dissection and in, in not just high school frog and fetal pig dissection, but also in university level um, in human anatomy courses, most often people dissect um, pigs or um, uh, cats for the most part. Um, so that's part of it. And then in physiology laboratory courses, you know, you would use a mouse and you inject it with something or you measure different hormone levels and things like that. So that's really animals. And then in veterinary colleges and, you know, just beyond the normal thing. And then in some professional programs like that, you have, you use animals for educational purposes or training purposes. Okay. Good. That's a very good 101. Um, so, okay. So folks, just so you know, uh, I am going to start peppering. I already peppered one of uh, the questions that somebody had asked in the chat, and I will continue to do that. But just so that I know what is a question and what is you just chatting, do a star, star, star Q before your question. If you haven't done that till now, don't worry about it. But going forward, just do star, star Q. If you have a question, Kirsten's looking for them in the chat. Um, uh, Charu, I'm going to ask you, um, Isle uh, asked a question. She uh, they said, is it possible for Charu to provide the source for the data she just chair shared, the 95% failure rate? I work in a municipality of medical schools and would like to have that source. Yes, absolutely. There are multiple papers that reference that. I can provide that. Okay. Um, and do you, is there anywhere on the center's website that might have that? Char, or you, or you um, have a link we're actually to that. updating our website okay. um, soon and we, we will likely have some stuff it's just it takes so much effort to put everything that we need in into one place um, to a database but there are references available on PubMed um, the, the National um, Institute of Health uh, database okay. that has you know like all the, the biomedical research publications Mm, wonderful. Okay, so Charo, you've got um, your uh, you've got some uh, sources to be able to share with us yes. um, here in the chat. Oh, I I'd, I'd have to look them up. And yeah, yeah, no, 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 so no, no worries. Send them to you, and then so you what I was going to say is yes, okay. send them to me, and then I will okay. share them uh, mm -hmm. both on the um, in the course uh, platform uh, under the lunchtime live, and I'll also share it in our private Facebook group. So, okay, excellent, Charo. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to get into the alternatives, but first, I, I, I think we really need to address, you know, one of the things that I know a lot of us are here for today, um, and that is about the animals themselves. Um, I mean, you, uh, at one time, I'm sure it feels like another life to you, you were an animal uh, researcher, you used animals in, in your research. Can you paint a picture of what it's like for animals being used uh, in science? What's it like from their point of view? I mean, I know that you have a limited, you know, sort of you can't can't know what they're thinking or what they experience. But what what have you observed and what do you know? I mean, you you if you look closely, you can understand what they're feeling. And that was the realization that I came to, right? So the heart failure work that I, I did, um, we had two different types of animal models. We had one where it was genetically modified, right? So they were missing a key um, molecule in the heart, in, in, in the heart tissues. And then the other one was where you actually cut open the, it's like open heart surgery, you cut open the chest, go into the heart, find the coronary artery and tie it with like um, a thread or, you know, this surgical suture um, and to limit the blood flow. So within a few weeks, they will go into full blown heart failure. And then you use these animals for research, but you know, so much, it's not easy to describe what it is like. So that's heart failure. And then for Alzheimer's, you do other things, you inject chemicals into the brain or you do surgical removal of certain things for diabetes, depend and then spinal cord injury, you sever the spinal cords of these animals. Um, so it, it depends on what area. Um, so usually, uh, to create a certain disease model, um, there are five ways of doing it. There's, you can surgically remove an organ or tissue, you can inject a chemical, you can genetically modify them, you can give them what we call diet induced. So you can put an animal on a high fat diet to get obesity to be a contributing factor. Um, and then also psychological induction. So this is where um, you may have heard of some of the famous studies by Harry Harlow, a, a researcher, a primate researcher in the US um, of several decades who started this work several decades ago. So where you, it's called maternal deprivation where you 
take baby monkeys away from their mothers and put them in these you know dungeons and separate them and expose them to all kinds of fear and anxiety inducing areas by showing them uh, snakes and spiders and dogs that primates are inherently afraid of. So there's this psychological trauma induction, right? So mm. as, as any researcher who wants to create a certain kind of disease model can combine any of these methods. You could combine a surgical method with the genetic modification and put them on a high fat diet. So you could do any of these things to create that model. With toxicity testing, with chemical safety testing, it's different. Um, you're not really making an animal sick with a disease, but you are trying to see what kind of adverse health effects you can get from exposure to chemicals. And the way that's done is to sort of mimic the same way that humans would get exposed to a, a certain chemical. And that's through four routes, either by eating it, ingestion, by inhaling it, um, and or exposure through the skin. So absorption um, or direct injection, right? Intravenous, there are drugs that are given intravenously. So animals are then subject to the same thing. If you want to do inhalation toxicity studies, you would take a rodent and I don't have it. I, I, I thought I had something here, but you would put them into these chambers um, where it, it's a, essentially a tube like this, where you put the rodent in there. And then on the other end, you it, it's like this dispenser that will dispense these um, chemicals in aerosol form, whatever form that the product will be used by humans, the animals are exposed that way and they're exposed to that chemical for certain hours a day and then you let them go for however many um, days, whether it's you know acute exposure from 24 hours to a few days or chronic exposure which could, which could be you know up to a year uh, for some of these assays or even two years for some of the cancer bioassays and reproductive toxicology. So animals can be exposed to any of those things and they're fed a certain amount of chemicals if it's through ingestion. Um, and you know, I, did I mention that dogs are the number one non-rodent species used in, in toxicity testing? So you would feed them these, you know, in their food and in their water, you'd put all these toxins in there and wait for them to um, show up. Um, wait for them to develop certain adverse effects. And the same thing with skin absorption, you'd put it on their skin, um, whether, you know, to detect the things. So yeah, that's what, what life is like. And these animals do not receive painkillers for most of these experiments, especially, um, you know, if they're used for product safety testing, they're not given um, painkillers um, at all times. It, they might be in, in certain circumstances, but even in biomedical research, um, there are cases where animals are not given painkillers because that could interfere with the results, the outcome of the research. Oh, Charu, I mean, I think a lot of us know this information, but just to have it really put out there, it's just like, what a nightmare. Um, I think we need some good news now. <laughs> And so, um, you know, Ralph was asking, he said, I would like to hear more about the alternative methods. Ralph, so would I. Uh, he said, what is there besides organ on chips? But I think you need to also tell us about organ on chips. So tell us what are some alternatives that are happening and what okay. are you folks working on? <laughs> Again, I need the rest of the afternoon to talk about all the alternatives, but just to sum it up, um, there is no single method that really encompasses everything that we want to study, right? So this is really, the use of alternatives is really context dependent. If you're looking at a disease to see if, you know, your RNA changes under a certain disease condition, then you use a certain set of um, techniques that would be able to, that would be able to give you the answers that you want. And so um, creating human biology in a Petri dish is really about, um, capture using a, a number of different tools in our arsenal and using them in a creative way so you could answer um, you could get answers to certain biological questions depending on the context whether you're creating a disease or looking for um, the effects of, of uh, a, a toxin so the the alternatives can be categorized broadly into now I feel like I'm in, in a lecture. <laughs> um, I, I do offer Canada's first graduate course in this field. I must Wonderful. say it's called, um, it's called the human subject, uh, animal three methods in biomedical research and toxicology. And I've so far I've taught it twice. Um, and I'll be teaching again this fall, and it's incredible. To, and, that's, to and that's regular uh, science students that take that, then, Charles? 
master's and PhD students um, have been taking that course. And it's just really nice to see how their minds open and how they're just so excited about some of these new technologies. So to go back to the original question, there are things that we could do in a Petri dish. There are things that we could do with computational models. So the five main categories are in vitro. And this really vitro in Latin is just, or Greek is just glass. And so it's essentially what you could do in a Petri dish that kind of outside of the body. Then there is um, ex vivo methods, which means outside, ex vivo, outside of the Bible. So any organ that you can take out of a human, for example. So if you're going through heart um, transplants, you can take that diseased heart that was, you know, that's going to be thrown out anyway, but you take that heart, you could technically take it back to a research laboratory and make it beat again. And you can infuse it with drugs. You can do different things and even what we call precision cut tissue slices. Even if it's just from a small biopsy, you can take those tissues back to a laboratory and do a number of studies to understand really what happened, um, especially with chronic diseases, right? These humans have been experiencing these things for a decade or two, and then all of that information is really contained in those tissues. Um, and then there's things where um, you could actually, you know, with in vitro methods, you can engineer tissues. This is one of the things that we do in my laboratory. We create 3D bioprinted human tissue models. This is an old dried up thing, but this is what it is. We have these petri dishes like this um, and the cell culture where, and then this is what the they would look like. Um, the printed tissue, we can print any pattern that we like. Um, and then you can keep them in culture uh, for several weeks. Um, and this is the organ on a chip, right? This is really a um, the chip the size of a thumb drive. And you can plate your cells in these little holes there and have fluid travel through. And, and right now, the focus is really um, in this field is to combine multiple chips. So you could have a heart on a chip, a liver on a chip, brain on a chip, pancreas on a chip, kidney on a chip, and to combine them together, to connect them together, much like in the human body to have a system systemic um, representation of how things would you know travel to the 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 liver a drug would travel to the liver get it metabolized and it goes to the kidney and get excreted so soon enough within the next five to ten years we are going to be able to see that you know a human on a chip um, kind of technology and the other things are also using you know imaging right in in vivo so real experiments with humans, consenting humans, of course, um, but doing you know non-invasive um, imaging technologies, biomonitoring studies. There's a lot of epidemiological studies with data that we can have access to. And of course, computational modeling in silico studies where you could do, you could really simulate scenarios that would never be possible even in an animal model. So there are all these, you know, within each of those categories, there are lots of different technologies that you could use. Um, and if you're thinking about, you know, chemical safety testing, this is where we've had the most amount of advancements um, at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development at the OECD. There are about uh, 35 um, te chemical test guidelines that have been approved by all 35 OECD nations including Canada that people can adopt, where in some cases, uh, uh, these tests that have been around for decades um, have been replaced with a simple human cell-based studies. Mm -hmm. Someone, uh, let's see, uh, where did it go here? Just one second. Someone was asking if you have any sense of uh, what the uh, success rate of the alternative methods are. I mean, I guess since it's so young and in its infancy, um, is there any sort of success rates out there? Yes. So some of these um, models or some of these test guidelines and protocols that have been approved even at the OECD level and these other models that are currently in development we are seeing that they are able to far better predict human outcomes than animal models. Um, and so one of the, you know, there was a paper that came out recently with um, uh, organ on chip models with liver chips, where they looked at, where they did a rat chip. So they took rat liver cells and put it on this system and human liver chips and dog liver, and they compared them and they took a whole bunch of drugs from a number of different companies, drugs that failed um, animal testing because they had some, you know, adverse effects in the liver and they put it on the human on a ship and they were able to see that, no, these, these drugs, this, these particular drugs would not have had any adverse effects. 
um, in humans and they were able to re recreate that they would have the adverse effects in the mouse on a chip and or the rat on a chip and the dog on the chip. So there's a lot of um, exciting data out there and these uh, alternative methods, me oh, I, I don't really even like to call them alternative methods, honestly, because animal models should be the alternative for the last resort. <laughs> yes. <But it's> <laughs> no, the, these human biology based methods, animal free methods are, are essentially cheaper, faster, and far more human predictive. Mm. I, it's it's almost like I can envision once all of these technologies are you know take hold. It's almost like when DNA testing came out and they went back to all these cases and were able to exonerate people or find the the killer. And it's almost like we'll be able to go through all of these failed tests and find these you know these gems that that could could be real like you know could cure some huge things. Like it's it's really exciting. It, uh, yeah, the future really is animal free. Um, I am, I, I mean, I don't know, I, I have this dream and I think someday um, animal testing will end in this country. And I hope it really happens in my generation because I want to. You want to see it. I want to see that yet. happen. <laughs> So, I mean, we currently don't, from, from what I understand, from what you've taught uh, me, is, is we currently don't have the non-animal based technology to be able to replace the animal models being used right now in science. What do we need to do to get there? What is stopping us? Uh, that's a loaded question. Um, Sounds like, <laughs> like I, I, I'm, I'm thinking money is probably one um, of the biggest so, ones, right? Um, absolutely. Um, so in general, I guess from my, I, I'll talk about what I'm experiencing right now. There are different issues at different levels. So one, I mean, my, if somebody asked me to name the number one struggle that I have, it's money. You know, I'm on a continuously, I'm like begging with, you know, for pennies sometimes um, to keep this work alive and to, to do this work. Um, and it's really difficult sometimes to go through the traditional routes, right? If you're applying for Canadian Institutes of Health Research or the National Research Council, National Research Engineering and um, Research Council, NSERC, it's, it's hard because those grants are peer reviewed by a lot of animal researchers themselves. And there's nothing wrong with them per se, but it's just, then you have to go through these hurdles of, well, you need to prove your model in a, in a mouse or a dog. And I'm like, I'm not doing that, right? So it's not something that's personal to me. It's just something that a lot of researchers in, um, who are venturing into human biology based research areas are experiencing right now. So. Um, funding is my number one, my biggest struggle. And I really wish, honestly, I really wish I could have a, a few million dollars so I don't have to worry about money for the next five years because um, it's taking away a lot of time that I have, that I could be developing all these disease models. I have, we have so many things going on in the lab. And I was, I was, I think I mentioned that earlier, there's a model that we're developing that, that I hope would, help reduce and replace the use of dogs in, in chemical safety testing. Um, I don't have money to do some of the things that I think would be very unique, very Canadian projects. Um, and, and I don't know where that money is gonna come from. It's, um, it's, it's a continuous struggle. And then at the same time, there are other things that you know, can be done. I think consumers have a responsibility to purchase animal-free products, cruelty-free products you know, with that bunny. Um, and that really sends a message to everyone, the product developers, um, that this is what we are looking for in the third decade of the 21st century. And then of, of course, everyone should write to their MPs and, and ask them to bring forward the quality free cosmetics bill to introduce you know, legislation that would provide better protection for animals in science in Canada, because right now we don't have much for animals in science in Canada at all. We don't have um, a, a, an Animal Welfare Act specifically for animal free animals in science, like many other nations do. Um, so we have a lot of work to be done. And of course, I would love to get federal funding for my center because um, many of my counterparts have that kind of funding and they don't worry about um, what project they need to put on the back burner. Um, but I do on a daily basis. I have to choose between which projects are going to move forward and which are not. Uh, all right. Charu, um, people are asking where can they donate? Um, can they donate on uh, the center site or is there yes, a place so, in particular? 
right now our old website it is on the University of Windsor so it's um U Windsor so www.uwindsor.ca slash ccaam mm -hmm. um, and when you go there on the bottom there's a, a separate donation page but also there's a link on the home page at the bottom um, and it comes directly to the university but you know through this link it comes directly to my center and you do receive a tax receipt because the University of Windsor is a registered charity. Okay. And even if you're in the United States, actually for US um, customers as well, um, the university is registered with the, um, the US, um, in the US for tax purposes. Amazing. Okay, so um, the, uh, we put the link in there and the donate button is at the bottom and they don't have to put any special instruction. It'll just automatically go, go will, to, to if, you if folks. That account is set up to come directly, okay. but if you want to put a note I'm, um, in there, I think there's space to, to do that. Sure. If you guys want to say uh, AJ or uh, donating specifically to um, the, the CC, um, Sorry, I always get this wrong. C C A A M. Then that's yeah. that's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Um, okay, Charu, just so that people get really excited, you've got a little video that I would <laughs> love for you to share. Um, it's nobody else yeah. has really seen this. It's not out to the public yeah, yet. Yeah, it's but not out. Um, it's not. I'm. We're going to be releasing this soon because we've developed a new website. And honestly, I don't have any support staff. I have my graduate students, I have my research staff, but I don't have an administrative assistant or a social media coordinator or anything. I do it all, um, everything by myself. Uh, and so we need to change that. Time for certain things. I run my research lab, I develop my academic programs, and we're actually even organizing um, the most prominent high profile conference in this field. It's called the, the World Congress on Alternatives and Animal Use in the Life Sciences. I'm actually co-chairing it. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the chair and then my two co-chairs are from Health Canada and from Environment and Climate Change Canada. That's next year. So there's so much going on. So we're behind on a little bit of this, but yeah, this video, this is our research facility. And honestly, this is something that I built from nothing. Um, but I have to say that I'm very grateful because it, you know, like I said, it started with a concept on the back of a napkin and it's, it's come to this now with research, with academic training, with all of these different wonderful things that we're doing. Um, and I do want to very um, specially acknowledge the Margulis family. Eric and Dana Margulis gave me that $1 million to get this center set up. Um, and it's, it's an incredible thing. Um, so I will share this. The one thing I request is that you do not share clips of this um, on social media yet, because I do want to release the full video in about a, a two weeks. So you can keep it in this talk, but please don't take clips of it and, and show it anywhere yet. Okay, okay let's see. Secret so. squirrel video, let's, let's see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it says host only. Who can, um, oh. oh, it should, I can't. I've got... Yeah, you're, you're oh, there. It's working. You got it. Okay. All right. Here we go. You can see my screen? Yep. Okay.
unbelievable. That um, uh, makes me emotional every time I look at it. Oh, Charu, you built this. You built this. Amazing. <laughs> no, it's 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 um it's nothing personal, but it's it's about creating change mm. in this world, right? I I honestly it's not just I, for the animals, but what about the humans? You know, just a couple of weeks ago. I saw this post on Twitter. It was a random Twitter from somebody I don't even know. I rarely go on Twitter. I only do post, you know, something for the center, right? But there were a couple of posts. There was um, some lady in Canada who said, my mom is um, going through a sister death tomorrow or something like that. And I don't have anyone to sit by my side. She's because she doesn't want to deal with um, ALS anymore. Yeah. So what do you tell someone like that? we're wasting billions of dollars on animal research yeah yeah when billions of dollars so i think i heard you say two billion dollars just to get a drug approved through the animal model and and all you need is a measly few million to you know change the world and it's yeah it's so so the last thing i want from you charu is what okay you've got over 80 um here and we've got more probably over 100 people here live right now that want to do everything they can to support you and support this work and support changing the system what are some of the things that we as as animal advocates can do you know you mentioned of course donate um you mentioned cruelty free products who should we be writing who should we be lobbying so definitely speak with your MPs and this is not a partisan issue, right? So whatever party that you're affiliated with, it doesn't matter. They should all be working towards it. Canada is lagging behind um, in this field. We don't have any legislation. We don't have anything really, when you think about it, um, that other countries do, that the European Union does, that the United States does. Um, and so definitely write to them, ask them to do this, and then to work with organizations like yours um, to, to deal with this. And anytime you're donating to a charity, for example, if you're donating to Heart and Stroke Foundation, I'm not, I should not name anyone, but it, I'm just giving an example. It's not, I don't have anything against uh, any charity, but whether it's cancer for heart disease, lung disease, liver, whatever the charity, health charity may be, ask them if they could put your money to a very specific um, area because right now you don't have a choice when you donate to one of these organizations it could be going to all animal research but maybe you should urge them and they do the canvassing around your neighborhood ask them to create this and maybe get the conversation and then of course have those conversations at the water cooler people do not know a lot of people sometimes i'm surprised people when i meet people at different you know events like a veg fest or something where i'm giving a talk they're like oh animal testing doesn't happen and i'm like of course it does canada we use over 5 million animals a year and our numbers we are on an upward trend we've been using more animals every year um, than the year before um, so we are lagging behind in many areas and people can get involved in many different aspects and i have to say the future is very bright i work with an amazing group of people i'm not just saying at the university of windsor i'm just saying globally from academia from industry from government people who have this common um interest to advance science and ethics um, for for humans and for animals so the future is bright but we need to get there and then we may have very specific hurdles to jump over here in Canada mm -hmm. yeah just I, I hate to break it to you folks but the problems that we have with farmed animals and no over government oversight on uh, for animals on farms same thing in laboratories it's the regulations are made by a private charity that is mostly run by industry interests. So, um, so same thing. And um, so, so Charu, I think you've given us some marching orders. Um, we need to get, get the word out there in, in the way we talk to people um, in, in, some of us are really great at social media. Some of us are really great at media in general. Some of us are great at community conversations. And I'll tell you, Charu, I've had, I've had multiple conversations with different charities when they've canvassed to me or or, and and I have gotten some really like I've gotten up to top the top people on this and been able to inform them and you know let them know this is a concern and, and these are the alternatives so like one person you know kind of asking the question at an organization can go a long way 
Um, so uh, Charo, I just want to share some of the folks that are saying, um, Cheryl said, how about a $2 million GoFundMe campaign worldwide? Um, if an AJ Air wants to take up that, that mantle, that would be an incredible way to, um, to contribute to uh, this this really important uh, animal issue. So, um, you know, if anybody's interested in taking that on, being the lead on that, please let me know. Um, there, uh, Debbie said, uh, I bought a Lotto Max ticket and the next draw is a cool 70 million. If I win, you, there's some coming your way. Um, <laughs> there, there are people here that are just um, saying how beautiful you are, Charu. Christina said, I'm in tears. Thank you, Charu. You are a beautiful person. And everybody's saying how much they love your lab and how clean it is and how, how friendly and it, and beautiful oh it is. Oh my goodness. It is very clean. And honestly, all of my, my people here, my students and my scientific staff, they, uh, we keep it really clean. That wasn't just staged. <laughs> and, and this is one of the issues that I have at home too. And my husband was like, how is it that you're able to keep the lab that clean, but the house a mess? <laughs> Every time he cleans everything up, I, uh, I, you know, I mess it up for him. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and Kirsten, would you mind taking uh, Charu off stop spotlight so she can see everybody? Um, and I have to say, Charu, when I saw that um, hashtag uh, animal free, what was it? Animal free research? Yeah, I, that made me tear up and goosebumps all at the same time. Incredible. And so I want you to go back now to the gallery view. It's at the top of your screen, Charu, on the right. Yes, um, so everyone. you can see everyone because we're here behind you. We have tears in our eyes and we are, we are there for you. Folks, let's give Charu a big AJ. Thank you. Charu, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. We love you and we will do everything we can uh, to help you and, and keep your, your center um, going and strong. Okay, folks, we really need to pull together for this. Uh, that's one of my biggest fears that I don't want to yeah. cut this down because I don't have money. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So if you know folks, if you um, can uh, lobby, uh, whatever we can do, folks, just let's, let's get a couple of million to support this national, like this huge national drive um, that is uh, going to help free animals in, from the laboratories in Canada. Charu, thank you so much. Thank you, AJ Ayers, for Thank all coming you. out. Like I said, we have about 100 people live uh, at, uh, at the high point in the, um, uh, in the lunchtime live. And so we really appreciate you being here and in community. Uh, folks, the next lunchtime live is June 16th. It is with the Excelsior 4. I hope you will join us. And I will pass on all of your love to Charu because she hasn't had a chance to read it. But I will, I, I will send her the whole chat so she can uh, see it all. Thank you, Charu. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week. And, um, and let's do everything we can for the, the animals that are in science that we need to free from science, okay? Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.